Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Times of refreshing. <clears throat> and we were in verse 19 years. So let's just recap some things we said <clears throat> last night. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And I said to you that that's not a future work of Christ. That is something he has done. Uh, we said the word excellifo means to cancel out something and wipe it off in such a way that you won't see it again. Colossians 2.14, Paul used it in Colossians 2.14. It's canceling out the handwriting that was written against us. And then in Revelation 3.5, uh, John mentioned it about the book of life. Revelation 7.17 7, as well. And 21.4, uh, wiping up tears so that you won't see it again. In other words, this, the, the, the work of Counseling sins is related to the resurrection. Pay good attention here. And then we said that when he said who he will send Jesus, and we said that was send Jesus is not futuristic. It's what has already happened upon the resurrection. The word apostello, which he repeated in verse 26. Let's just quickly uh, go over that just a little bit. Um, you know, we said, he said, repent, therefore, and be converted. The word converted is epistrepho, to turn around. In other words, change your mind, okay, and take your focus on what Christ has done. Basically, that's what he's saying. Because what he was saying before then was the resurrection, the event that they saw as eyewitnesses. But then beyond eyewitnesses, uh, the apostle Peter now points them to the prophets, that the prophets have said is, we witnessed it, and so you need to turn your attention to it. What do you need to turn your attention to? That Jesus Christ, pay attention, in his resurrection, he blotted out our sins. He excellently for, he, take, he took it away. You can't find it again. Uh, when you look at it, you will see it. And that's what he's saying here. Where do you look at it? Not in someone's testimony, not in someone's experiences, but in the words of the prophets. Uh, and that's what uh, Peter is saying here. So he's saying this has happened before. Uh, so this has been prophesied before. And then we are preaching that unto you. Now pay attention here. He now talks about Moses and all the prophets from Moses in 21. And in 22, he talks about Moses' prophecy in uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, 18, and 19 where he spoke about a prophet that will rise, and that's talking about Jesus. Then he says in 24 that all the prophets from Simon and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Now, this is Peter being a very good student of the, of the word. This is exactly how Christ taught them. And just like he did in Acts 2, he teaches the same way. In other words, he, he goes into the Old Testament and he looks at the prophecies and he says, these prophecies today have been fulfilled in Christ. Okay, so then he goes further in 25. You are the children of the prophets. Now, when he said that, he's talking to the Jews. I am not the child of the prophet. I know my hometown. So the audience here is the Jew. All right. And the covenant which God made with our father, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Now, that's a term that we need to realize uh, 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 very well. In, in you shall all the nations, the kindreds, the families be blessed. So, in other words, he's saying that God gave a promise to Abraham, and this is the promise. That in thee, or through your action, through what you've done as a model, a prototype, uh, Romans 4.12, shall all the nations, the families of the earth, be blessed. So, what is that blessing? Look at that blessing. Verse 26. Verse 26 is, unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him, the same word apostello that was used in verse 20, sent him to bless you. How? How? Come on. In turning away every one of you from the iniquities. Now, he uses the word apostrepho. You know, it was epistrepho earlier on in verse 19. Now, it's apostrepho. That means to take away from, okay? Who does the turning away from sins? Jesus. 
How does he do it? Verse 19 and 20. By canceling the sins. So the blessedness of Christ is that he cancels the sins in his resurrection. I need your attention because there's something we need to clear a bit in this session. I hope I can in the second one. And that's the work of Christ. What did he do? Now, whenever we talk about sins like that, there's an idea that God kept the sins somewhere or the records of the sins somewhere. And so Christ now died, then wiped off the records. That's not what he's saying. Uh, you need to get, get that very well. That's not what he's saying at all. So Christ now came, or we have this uh, heavenly house where God is the chief judge, and then the Holy Spirit, I don't, I don't think he has a role yet, but God is the chief judge, so when you sin, they keep the records, so you, you sin, they keep the records, you keep sin, they keep the records, keep the records, keep the records, keep the records. So Jesus now said, this record is too full. So he dies. He brings his blood, goes to the record house, and begins to clean the records of the sin. You know, that's quite good for movies, but that's not the word of God, okay? Why does he use the resurrection to demonstrate that cancellation? Why didn't he use the death of Jesus? I thought the death should have been it because the death would be a penalty. So the death would be the one that will pay for sins. But he uses the resurrection. And so that's important because it will let us see what he's saying and God's role in all of that. Are you following that? All right, good. So, here we go. Obviously, uh, very critically, is that Peter is teaching the way Jesus taught them. The way Jesus taught them. And so, that's why last night, we were in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, as we call it. Matthew 28. Are you there? Come on, guys. Are you there? Are you there? I'm going to open to quite some scriptures this morning. Will you be ready? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. Now, this is the very last words of Jesus that Matthew in his Gospels wrote. Let me give you a heads up. Now, Matthew's account was not simultaneously as those things happened. So that means Matthew's account will have the privilege of the resurrection before he documents. Though he will not go into the details of the resurrection, okay? But he wrote this account after the fact. That is, the event had happened, Jesus had been raised, the ministry had been established. In fact, it's said in many historical records that most of the, most of the four Gospels were written after uh, the epistles were already in circulation. So, in other words, it means that Matthew is writing something everybody knew. Okay? And so, within his uh, account, you will have what you can call Matthew's interpretation that came upon the resurrection. Pay very good attention here. Like I said, he didn't write it simultaneously as what happening, you know. So he had the benefit of insight upon the resurrection when he writes this account. So pay good attention here. So in Matthew 28, he's writing the last events or the last things Jesus said. In case you need to know, Jesus had just been crucified. And so his disciples were, you know, trying to find out what happened to his body. And so along the line, you know, accounts came from one from Mary Magdalene, some that went to the grave, and they came back and, you know, uh, brought the accounts back to them. Then Jesus obviously asked the 11 to meet him at a particular place. In verse 16, then the 11 disciples went away, Matthew 28, unto Galilee, unto a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, what he said in verse 17 looks like a similar event, but it's not. We'll see that shortly. In, in 18, he came and spake to them, saying, 
all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, that's a little bit interesting. Um, you call people who were doubting whether you were raised from the dead. Then they come to meet you in a place. Then as they came to you and looked at you, all you said to them is, hey guys, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Hello? All authority? How? Hello. So in other words, um, verse 19 or 18 will be Matthew's capture, or you can call it, is a summary of many things that Jesus said. All authority, <coughs> excuse me, is given to me in heaven and in the earth. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now, how would you just go to people who just before now ran away, believe you will never come back to life? Then you say to them, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go. <laughs> they go into all the world and do what? Make disciples of every nation. With what? With our doubting experience? No, that, that just doesn't flow. Then he says to them in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Something is out of place there. In other words, it's not as detailed enough as you would want it. Now, when he says, let me quickly mention this, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Now, that phrase, in heaven and in earth, deals with man. In other words, I have this authority in man or towards man. It's not about planets or about things. It's about men. Look at Matthew 16 when he said to Peter, said, uh, uh, and he says to Peter, uh, uh, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He said, thou art Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shouldn't prevail against it. Matthew 16, 17 and 18. And I said, I, I said to you, Yo, Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church. I said, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever things you bind on earth, he's bound in heaven. And whatever things you lose on earth, he's lose in heaven. Now, if you check the ch second time that phrase is used in Matthew's Gospel 18 from about verse 16, uh, when the same phrase was used, and he said to them, look, if a brother offends you, you go to him. If he doesn't listen to you, go with two or three. I don't know if two or three witnesses that will be established. Then he says, if he doesn't hear the two, tell it to the church. And then he says, if you hear the church, whatever, let him treat him like a sinner and a publican. Then he says, whatever is bound on earth is bound in heaven. Notice it's about human relationships. So heaven and earth is a phrase for man. Or put it like this, when you see that phrase, it's God's work amongst men. So heaven will be the spiritual. The earth will be the place of interaction. That's what the phrase means. That is, whatever you do, according to the word, is heaven on earth. That's what it means. So when you see that phrase, so when it says, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth, it means God's work amongst men, okay, is now through me. So he says, go ye therefore, in verse 19, and make disciples of every nation. Then he says, teaching them, pay good attention, to observe, observe what? What things soever I have commanded you. These guys just doubted him. They just fled, ran away. Lo, I am with you always, he says, until the end of the world. Now, pay good attention to this. When he says the things I have commanded you, 
It's an old Greek word, entelomai, E-N-T-E, double L-O-M-A-I. It means instruction. Write this down. Of things adding up to a very particular end. Or things that have happened, things that are happening, or things that are to happen. And so it's a, it's a big word that relates with the things that Jesus just did, he's doing, and he will do. So it brings about a whole lot of things in what he's saying. And we'll find out what he means. Again, this account is not so exhaustive for us to know the things he meant. Let me see you on the following what we're saying here. Come on. Let me see you on the following. Come on. So this account is not broad enough for us to know what he's talking about. Now, Good enough, we have four accounts of this. So if we put them together, we'll have an idea of what he was saying, a better idea of what he was saying. The second one will be Mark 16. Mark 16, 15. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why did he say that? Now, in verse 14, can, can, us, can, can we take verse 14 together, Mark 16? Let's go. Verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them that had seen him after he was risen. So, in verse 14, he upbraided them, which is to correct or find a fault, is the word one diesel. O N E I D I Z O. It means to find fault, okay, or to spot a wrong. Now, that phrase was used in the ministry of Jesus a couple of times. Jesus himself used it in Matthew 5 11 when he says, Blessed are you when men insult you. Or find fault in you. Own a diesel. Interestingly, that's negative. Now, in Matthew eleven twenty, Matthew again is writing. And he says, Jesus upbraided the cities. That is, he, he, he found a fault in what they were doing. Now, there are other places in Matthew 27, 44. And Mark 15, 32, which was used towards Jesus. But in James 1, 5, and also Luke 6, 22, just write down, Matthew 27, 44, Mark 15, 32. Luke 6, 22 is just about the same thing with Mark, Matthew 5, 11. Now, in James 1, 5, James now says, if any lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and doesn't upbraid. Mark, James 1, 5. The word upbraid there is the same word, one diesel. Now, how come James is saying he doesn't find fault? Now, like I've always said to you, words only have meanings in the sentences where you use them. I've seen people say, God does not condemn. God does not condemn. That's not true. God condemns. Make sure that when you say God does not condemn, you are referring to a particular scripture and a particular situation. Always use words in the sentences and the paragraphs where they're used. That's what gives them meanings. If you use dictionaries, you discover that dictionaries will give you a word, then the probable meanings. And many times they will put it in different sentences. It depends on the sentence. So you cannot make a, 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 a you can't use one single paintbrush for every word. That's wrong. So words only have meanings in the sentences where they are used. So when James says, who will find fault? He won't find fault not to give you. That's what he's saying, James 1, 5. 
However, we just read now, according to Matthew's account, that Jesus found a fault in his disciples. What was the fault? The fault was, it says, for their unbelief, apostio. It means they were not for faith. Mark 16, 14. And the hardness of their hearts, sclerocardian, sclerocardian in the Greek, S-K-E-L-E-R-O-K-A-R-I-D-I-A, S-K-E-L-E-R-O-D-A, cardian, C-A, sorry, D-I-A, cardian. It means their heart was not yielding to the word of God. Hallelujah. I don't think he hugged them and thanked them for not believing. Hallelujah. He said, oh, Peter, you guys did a great job. You didn't believe. I believe he said to them, that's wrong. You should have believed. In fact, in one other instance we're going to read, he said, oh, fools, low of heart. That is only diesel. Praise the Lord. <laughs> because they were foolish. You don't thank a Christian for being foolish. I thank the Lord for your life, for your foolishness. No, 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 no. Foolishness is a wrong deed. So, words only have, you say, God does not condemn. God does not condemn. And that's why some people came up with some funny, funny things. And, you know, and sometimes when you have people who, who like to hear preachers so that they can get sermons, they are likely not going to understand what you are teaching. Because they are there to get what to preach. So, the moment they hear you to a point, Wow! God does not go there because you quoted a verse and some verses after it and explained the particular answer. God does not go there. If you find condemnation anywhere, it is the devil. Bros, calm down. Hallelujah. That's wrong. You should wait till the speaker is done. And you know, some guys just get a hold of nonsense like that and then they run with it. So, words only have meanings within the sentences where they are used. Praise the Lord. For example, I like to use this example. Look at this statement, for example, when you say, it's your cup of tea. We have a board meeting. And then, this is the chairman. And you, or I am the personal secretary of the chairman. And so the board meeting was about to start. And then the chairman, normally, I mean, he should get briefings from me where I write what he should talk about and all that. And then he, he, he says, oh, how are you, chairman? Good morning. I said, good morning, sir. Then he says, uh, what is it for me? What do you have for me today? Then I look into his eyes. I said, that's your cup of tea. I'd better turn my hand to somewhere where there's a cup of tea or he will show me to the HR. HR, no security. So if I say, that's your cup of tea, I must show a cup of tea. But if I look at it and say, that's your cup of tea, that means I've applied somewhere and they have employed me. <laughs> so you must, a word can have a different meaning based on what was said before it and what was said after it. And that's why I tell you, Context is always king. Words must be left in their context. Do not do what I call um, a, a concordance study of the Bible. You say, where do I have onediso, onediso? Oh, and, and you look for upbraid, 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 upbraid. Then you get confused. Read it in the context. What do you mean by Jesus upbraided them? Now, there's an upbraiding where people will insult you insult you for the kind of car you drive. I remember a guy, like a man like that in my, in the battle then when I was in secondary school. He had this car, very old car. Now if I say a car was about 15, 20 years old, then you know what I mean by old. Old car. And the car was a right hand drive. So he would drive the car. And normally, of course, when people say, ah, what is this? I know if you are in Ibadan, they can say something like, say, or call Lele, you know, they can say very funny. They can, Ibadan people can say something very funny, you know. And so the man, knowing the people, 
now on his car, wrote very loud, very big letters, Tieda. <laughs> that is, where is your home? <laughs> so, if you look at it, before you abuse him, you say, well, I'm walking anyway. <laughs> you know, so there's a way people can insult you, all right, and say, see what you are wearing, see what you have done. And though they have found fault, but they now insult you. Now, God doesn't do that. In his own upbraiding, he will correct you with the solution. For example, if you go to school, or when we went to school, you write what is wrong. Okay, assuming you, you did your, okay, let me put it like this. In the university, we hardly knew what the correct answers were. You submit your script, you look at the board, you see your grades. And the teacher can come the next term or session uh, or semester and say, all of you. In fact, we had a class te a teacher like that. He used to teach, I don't want to mention the course so that he will know he's the one. I believe I love him. He would say, you are too many in this class. You will fail it. I mean, from the first day in the class, you will fail it in the first day. And the man's heart will just fail for fear. Somewhere he was speaking in tongues, begin to speak the understanding. What is this? Now, you, you submitted it, and then he comes back and just says, four of you had A's, six of you had B's, some of you had C's, all of you just failed. You know, you don't get to know it. But then, and that is, he found fault, all right, and that's what it is. But then there are those who say, well, maybe in the secondary school, you did an exam or a test, and then the man says, wrong, 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 correct. Then he comes to the board, then he says, this is wrong, this is right. Now, he has found fault with the solution. Let me see if you understand. That's what God does. That's what Jesus did. He upbraided them for their unbelief in Mark 16, 14, okay? And then he didn't stop there. How did he upbraid them? We're about to see. Are you learning something here? So the point is, again, you know, we started from Matthew 28, that Jesus said, go into all the world, make disciples of every nation, but we don't have the details of what he did. Obviously here, Mark has added something to it. You know, Matthew said they doubted him. Mark says he corrected them for their doubts. Are you following this? So Mark has given us another idea. He corrected them for their doubts. He rebuked them, all right, for their doubts. Now, look at John. I'll skip Luke for a reason because Luke is the one that was more expansive. Look at John. John 20. In John 20, remember before now, he says to Mary Magdalene, go to your brethren, tell them I go to my father, your father, I send to my father and your father. In John 20, 17. <clears throat> then he meets them in 19. He says, peace unto you, John 20, 19. And then he showed them his hands in verse 20. And then in 21, he says, peace unto you as my father has sent me, even so send I you. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. Now, as my father sent me where? Remember, we came back from Acts 3. My father didn't send me into the world. That's not what he's saying. As my father sent me where? Acts 3. You're going to see it later on. He sent me into your heart. Even so send I you. Okay, so he's saying, ask my father, that is, because my father in the resurrection has sent me to you, this is the basis where you will go. So the, the authority I have right now is because my father sent me to you. This is the resurrection now. As he said that, the next verse, he breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Ghost. He breathed on them. That's kind of funny. These guys are still doubting whether he's been raised from the dead. And they're all there. Then he says, as my father has sent me, so I send you. And they're still looking at him. Then he goes around there like this. I 
kind of funny. Praise God. No, that's not what he did. Look at the word them. The word them is italicized. Because the word breathe on is one word. It's the word empusaho. E-M-P-H-U-S-A-O. E-M-P-H-U-S-A-O. It means to quicken inside someone. It's just used one time in the New Testament Greek. It means to cause a man to be alive inside him. It actually deals with to be, to make someone inside enthusiastic. That's a a colloquial, colloquial word, a colloquial use of that, pardon me. So it means to cause a man's heart to come alive, something like that. So he didn't put his nostrils on their heads, praise the Lord. <laughs> when he said he breathed on, that's John's explanation of the words he spoke to them. That is, the words he spoke to them caused breath in them. Hallelujah. The things he said to them breathed in them. Now, that's John. Of course, John, the next verse now says, whatever sins you remit, I remitted unto them. Whatever sins you retain, I retain as well. He says that. So let's look at Luke. So how many accounts do we have now? Three. We have Matthew. All right. Exhausted? Is it detailed? We have Mark. Is it detailed? We have John detailed? Not at all. And it's not the brief part. It's not detailed. All right. So, Luke is the one who is more detailed or most detailed. In Luke 24, now, you, there's a, the story how Jesus from verse uh, 15 or 13, there was these two people, Cleopas was one of them, who were on the road to Emma House. And then they were conversing about the events of the death of Jesus. And then he asked them in 17, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And then they began to, you know, muse and say, well, what are you asking me? Are you a stranger? Did you just come into town? You know, this is thing that happened a few days. Everybody knows about it. He says, what things? And then they told him stories, lamentations, how Jesus was a prophet in word and deed. Before God and all the people and how the chief priests and the rulers, you know, and they killed him and all that. And then they said, look, certain women in verse 22, they came, they told us they had seen him and all that. His body we have not found. Then when they were done with their sermon, he now says to them in 25, pay attention now, all fools, slow of heart. I think the Greek is, you are foolish. It's more direct. You are foolish and slow of heart. Anetos bradus kadia. Anetos bradus kadia. You are slow of heart or your heart is slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, look up guys. Did you notice that Jesus is not rebuking them for not believing what the women said they saw. That's not why he's rebuking them. Because there is no faith in that testimony. What Jesus is pointing out, he's not, why didn't you believe Mary Magdalene? Uh -uh. Is she not your sister? No. Oh fools, slow of heart to believe not Mary, because these guys were giving him the accounts of those who saw his grave. He said, no, I'm not talking about that. To believe all that the prophets have spoken. In other words, you need not hear Mary Magdalene to know I've been raised from the dead. That's what he's saying. Whole fools, low of heart. To believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ. Verse 26, 
to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. Now pay attention to this. This is very vital in Bible study. Again, this is Luke's writing. And most of the journalistic words, particularly in this instance, they are what you can call summaries of what he said. That you ought to have seen this in Malachi. You ought to have seen this in Isaiah. You ought to have seen this in the book of Psalms. Without anybody going to the grave or the sepulcher. To believe ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? That's a rhetorical question. Don't you know this is what the prophets were saying? Now, get this right. It didn't say that everything the prophets prophesied was about Christ. He never said that. Always be careful of the term all. The term all must be used within the context. For example, if I say all of them, or if I say everybody is in my house, you need to, for you to think everybody is an open-ended statement, what kind of house would that be? Where everybody is in my house. Everybody in your house? You mean the whole of Nigeria? The whole of Africa? No, now I said everybody who came for believers. Co- no, 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 that's not possible. Everybody who called me. You don't use words open handed. So when you say all, it should be all what? What was the discussion? The discussion was about his resurrection. So, Jesus was not saying everything in the Old Testament is about me. He never said that. But he's saying, if you investigate it well, you will see this story there. And this will help many people who try to find Christ in every verse. You are going to enter crisis. Christ is not in every verse. So, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning at Moses and all the prophets, pay attention now, he expounded where we have the word exegesis. That word makes some people have palpitation. Don't worry, more to come. Jesus, the word expounded there is a detailed explanation of facts. It's a painstaking explanation. What do you mean by that? That means he went through the Old Testament, line upon line, in this instance. Darmenio in the Greek, which means to explain the meaning. Darmenio is not an innovation. It's not a suggestion. It's not a presumption. It's the explanation. He wasn't trying to say it could be, it's likely, I'm not trying to be absolute, though. I'm just saying it's likely that it happened. No! He was exact. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now help me out again. What things again? The things about his resurrection. Not about his death, about his resurrection. Okay? The things about his resurrection. Of course, you can't have resurrection without death, all right? The man rose from nothing. He rose from the dead. No, no, he just rose. Rose from where? He must have died before he rose from the dead. Praise God. But the key issue is that he was talking about his resurrection. Then those folks in Luke 24, pay attention, they they didn't even know at that point it was him. People have wondered why didn't they know It was him. And I tell people oftentimes that, you know, Isaiah prophesied that upon the resurrection of Jesus, that he had no form of comeliness that we should desire him. He was married. And he was disfigured in the crucifixion. Jesus was not slapped. He was not just giving a few hits and say. Take care. If I was you, 
No, he was crucified. You know, there was a, one of them put a spear to his side. He was battered physically. And so, obviously, if you saw him on the cross, he must have had blood splattered all over his body. His face was murdered. He was disfigured. So it's very likely that these guys couldn't recognize him. And so many scholars agree, some disagree, not all, that when they were about to eat food, again, not the Holy Communion, hallelujah, shall die. They will say, it's the only communion that opened their eyes. There was no Holy Communion there. The Passover had ended. So this was breaking of bread. That it was at that point when he took the bread and broke it that it's likely that then the, the, the prints of the nails in his hands made them recognize him. This is the Lord. And then he vanished out of their sight. And the account of those guys in verse 32 says that did our hearts not burn Remember that statement? Emphasau, he breathed. Can you remember he breathed? Can you remember he breathed? Yes, Did our hearts not burn as he what? Open to us the scriptures. I tell you, it's not the scriptures that was opened, it's their, it's, sorry, it's, it's their hearts that was open. Because the scriptures were never closed. So, did our hearts not burn? In other words, when John was saying he breathed on, that's what he's talking about. His explanation of the Old Testament is that breathing. Let me see your hand if you understand that. Come, let me see your hand, please. Did our hearts not burn as he opened to us the scripture? So they went about to tell the others, and then he met them again in the room. When he met them in the room, of course, uh, they, they moved about, uh, uh, aside again. He said, no, trouble, be trouble not. I am the one, all right? Fear not. And then he, he said, okay, do you guys have food? They said, uh, yes, we, we do, master. Do you want to eat really? He said, I want to eat, okay, if you say so. And so they brought food to him. He ate the food right before their eyes. And when he was done doing that, he now said to them in 44, I need your attention here. He says, these are the words which, now, when he says, these are the words, I need your attention here. What is this? What is the focus of this discussion again? Is death or his resurrection? Is humanity or his resurrection? Okay. So these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Mark verse 44, because it's going to come in very useful shortly. That is, Jesus, by his resurrection, is explaining almost everything he said before it. So, the resurrection of Jesus is not just an event. It is an explanation. He is saying, see what I've just done. These were the words I had been telling you for three and a half years. These words. Now, how many days did he do this? Remember, we, told, we said that Matthew's account was not exhaustive. Can you remember that? Luke, uh, Mark wasn't exhaustive. John was brief. And I believe the reason why John was that brief was because John gave more details before the death of Jesus. John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So that's going to help us in a moment. So, so John was very brief in what he said. Because as my father sent me, when John said that, so send I you. John knew that in his writings, John 14, already 15, 16, in the 17, particularly 14 and 15, 
Jesus had already said, I will come again to you. So he had said that earlier. So if you had read John 14, and he says, as my father has sent me, so sent I you, you should know he's talking about in his resurrection, he's coming to dwell in us. You should have seen that in the previous chapters. Okay? But then we'll get, that, get to that. So here, Luke is more precise. Now, Luke gives us the number of days that Jesus did this. Acts chapter 1 verse 3. Acts chapter 1 verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them for how many days? Forty days. And speaking of the things where pertaining to where? The kingdom of God. Mark that word, the kingdom of God. So, what did Matthew say? Matthew just said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Go and teach. What did Mark say? Mark says, he, he, Matthew just said he instructed them to go. Mark, Mark, Matthew, sorry. Mark says he rebuked them and just told them to preach. John says he breathed on and then he said to them, whatever sins you retain, I retain. Whatever sins you remit, I remit it unto them. Only Luke supplies the details that he actually took them through the scriptures from Genesis, at this point, through to Malachi. And then in 44, he said, what you are seeing today is the fulfillment of the things I said to you before I died. Then in verse 45, as he began to explain the scriptures to them, 45 says, he opened he their understanding. The word open there is the word dianogio. Dianogio means to open something that had never been opened before. In other words, they saw the scriptures in a light they hadn't seen it before. He opened he their understanding. The word open is the word dianogio, to open something or to split wide a blocked entrance. That they, he, their understanding, the word understanding is the word nohus, N-O-U-S. It means mindset. He opened he, their mindset that they might understand. The second word is the word suinemi, S-U-I-N-E-M-I in the Greek, S-U-I-N-E-M-I. It means to make things to or to put things together. Things that are like, he now put them together. So what does he do? He takes them through the scriptures and shows them like prophecies. Prophecies that are like unto themselves. Prophecies that explain themselves. Prophecies that say the same thing. And then he opened their understanding. Now they understand Genesis. Now they also understand Exodus. Now pay attention here. There are two things I need you to see here. If you miss the first one, you miss the second one. Verse 44. He said, these are the words I speak to you while I was yet with you. In other words, hear this now. Jesus brought clarity to the teachings he had done in the four gospels. And that clarity was to use his resurrection as the same truth he had been saying. So, 44 will be the four gospels teachings of Christ. Which is clearly now in tandem or say in agreement with the Old Testament prophecies. He opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Now, is this how he rebuked them? Is this how he rebuked them? Is this how he corrected them? Is this how he breathed on them? Is this how he instructed them? For how many days again? Forty days. Look at 46. You learning something here? And he said unto them, 
Thus it is written, and thus it behold Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Now, you and I know that Jesus did not stand on the pulpit, as it were, and then for 40 days he said, All these things will be fulfilled which were in the law of Moses, in the prophets and Psalms concerning me. And he says, Christ indeed must suffer. I'm Christ, okay? I suffer, I rise within the third day. Amen. I'll see you tomorrow. Second day, Christ indeed must suffer. No, that doesn't make sense. That is the summary of a 40 day teaching. In other words, whatever they must teach, this must be the summary. From today forward. So when he says, go into all the world and teach, this must be. In other words, the subject matter of the preacher of the gospel, whether it's to the world or to the church, must be the same. So the subject matter must be consistent. So 46, 47 are the subject matter. He will suffer, rise from the dead the third day. And repentance, 47, come on, look at 47. Repentance, which is the remission of sins, will be preached in his name among all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. Mark the word remission of sins. So remission of sins has come out twice now. It came out in John 20, 23. It has come out again in Luke 24, 47. So, mark it in your notes because we're about to look at it in a close way. Or closer way. Pardon me. This is the reason after he was done with them, in verse 52, when they went back to Jerusalem, Luke says there was a mega chara, great joy, a wide sense of rejoicing. Megas Chara. They were rejoicing. Now, watch this. Remember, they were not rejoicing at miracles. He had told them in Luke 10, verse 20, that they should not rejoice because demons are subject to them. In other words, not at miracles. They should rejoice because their names are registered in heaven. Now, this, they didn't find that joy then. But they have now fulfilled the words of Jesus here now. Because whatever he said then, this is the reality. Now, they can rejoice. Go back to 44. The things I commanded you. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. The things I said to you, they are the same thing. What are those things? What it means is that we will find clarity of the teachings of Jesus in the four Gospels from his resurrection. We will find clarity in the teachings of Jesus from his resurrection. Go back again to Acts 1 3. Luke says he was teaching them concerning what? 3 and 4. Concerning what? The kingdom of God. Mark this phrase, the kingdom of God. Now, let's go to John and see a couple of things. In John, John records much of what Jesus said towards his death. In John 14, for example, he says to them, if you believe in God, believe also in me. Then he says, in my father's mansion, in my father's house, there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Take note of those terms so that where I am, there you may be also. If I go, I'll return and receive you to myself. Now, that means that before Jesus died, he said, my going is for a coming. And that coming 
will make us be in the same place. Now, as younger Christians, we used to think that this was the rapture. As I remember, a dear sister who was a very, very holy sister, very holy sister, she, she would say many times that God will tell her what to wear early in the morning. I don't dress, brethren, except the Holy Spirit tells me what to wear. And most of the time, when she wears what the Holy Spirit tells her to wear, you are very sure it's a spirit that told her to wear what she wore. You know, because someone that sees naturally shouldn't have said those things that she heard. And then she happened to, maybe she collapsed, maybe she died, maybe she whatever, something happened to her like death. And so she came back from where she died from, and she said she was in heaven. And how many like stories of those things? The reason why many people give you those stories is because they don't know what heaven is. So most of people's hallucinations are called visions. <laughs> because by the time some people return from wherever they went, you are too sure they went somewhere around the earth. Because all of them are just, they moved from the incredible to the ridiculous. I saw someone say, he died one heaven and then saw God the Father in the middle, Jesus Christ on the left, and God the Father wanted to send the angel to blow the trumpet. Jesus was not looking at God the Father, don't do it, don't do it. And then he went as far as say, Jesus now come at the mouth of the Father. Are you, what's that? There was another one here in Lagos that said, uh, he said, as uh, the father was angry, Jesus now showed him his blood. <laughs> anyway, this particular sister now says she got to heaven and then they, she found out what the mansion she had because we were told that as you begin to do your Christian life, you start to, uh, the first thing when you get born again, you start digging the foundation of your house in heaven. You dig, 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 dig. And then you begin to, uh, just you alone, you begin to, no labor, just you alone, you begin to put, and then, you know, you, you wherever you're buying cement from, we don't know, but you just produce the cement. So somehow you get the material. Where you got it from, we don't know, but I guess as you pray, God will give you one bag of cement. As you live right, he give you more sand, and then you keep building and building and building and building and building. And so she said that her house was like a shop. And she said that, I said, hey. I want to be like, if your shop, if you have a shop, me, I'll be hanging on the street. And she said, she was just in the house. It was not painted, you know. Many times like that, I guess many people drop their brains with the ushers when they come into the service. As they're leaving to get it back, then they start arguing at the car park. Amen. You lost that, did you? <laughs> so, so you got people argue at the car park, come to church, behave gently because they drop their brain. Then they go back to the car, then the car park is saying, what is, who parked there, who parked there? So somebody collected your real attitude at the door. So she said there was no paint. At that point, my brain wasn't working. She now said that, as she had no brain, no, sorry, <laughs> no paint, and there was no roof. I said to myself, you know, we have this greedy, covetous life that you want to have a whole mansion in a spirit world alone. <laughs> alone. You alone are worthy. Alone. So, are you an octopus? <laughs> Your entire body is everywhere. Anyway, so she said there was no room. At that point, my brain wasn't working yet. Because when many of us were there, she said, so it began to rain. Ah! Oh. <laughs> At that point, I cannot feel, uh-uh, uh-uh. I know if you are in an airplane, an aircraft, if you get to a certain height, you will see the rain like this. Sis was on earth. I beg. But I did not say it because 
My life was not even a testimony to preach any kind of thing. But I began to think that what kind of stuff is that, you know? But obviously, over the years in, in study and listening to people that taught the scripture as well, it was clear that Jesus wasn't talking about an escape. And then it became funny because if you look at it, in my father's house are many mansions. You don't have mansions in the house. So that's why it's good to go into the original language or some versions that clarify this. It ought to be in my father's household, in my father's oikia, there are many places. So Christ was talking about a family. And he's saying there will be room for many people in this family. Why does he use many? Why? Polus. He uses the word many, I guess that's the word. He uses the word many because at that point, he was the only son. And if you look at the epistles are consistent, calling us many sons. That's the mansions he's talking about. So here he says, right now, I am the father's mansion. Or I am the father's household, better still. He says that in verse 10, in verse 11. I am that father's house. He lives in me. Then in verse 16, mark that one because we're coming back there. He says, I will pray the father. He will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. In 17, he says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because he sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and shall be where? In you. You need to pay attention to these prepositions. He says, is with you and shall be in you. Write that down because we'll use it later on. So Jesus talks about a with, now, a in you. Now, look at chapter 14, 26, which is really where we're going to in this session. He says to them, so everything he's saying from verse 1 to this verse, where about his incarnation or his resurrection. Which one? Very fine. His resurrection. Pay attention. Look at 26. In 26 he says, But the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Does that include science? No. All these things I am saying. He will teach you all these things. He will bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. Now, this verse cannot be applied to you because he never spoke to you. He's talking to these apostles. He says he will bring to your remembrance in the resurrection. Whatever I have said to you. In other words, from the resurrection of Christ, every sermon of Christ in the four gospels will be clear to us. So he says here, to your remembrance. Now, the word remembrance there is the word hupomimnesco. Hupomimnesco is spelled H-U-P-O-M-I-M-N-E-S-K-O. H-U-P-O-M-I-M-N-E-S-K-O. What is it used for? It doesn't mean to remember something just like memory loss. No. Every time that word is used, we're going to see a couple of places where it's used. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. Are you in church? Talk to me, guys. Are you in church? 2 Timothy 2, 14. He says, all these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord. In other words, call their attention to it. Call their attention to it. It's not like they forgot you are telling them to look at it again. In other words, it's for clarity and much more. Again, Titus 3.1. Titus 3.1. The same terminology. Hupomimesco. Titus 3.1. Here's Paul. He says, put them in mind to be subject 
two principalities. Something that you now keep in your mind to the intent that you understand. You keep in your mind to the intent that you understand. So this word hypomimnesco is to understand something by paying attention to it. In 2 Peter 1, 12, Peter uses it for also teaching. As I, I tell your heart into remembrance, 2 Peter 1, 12, and 3 John 1, 10, John uses it also for the misdeeds of another person. And Jude 5, Jude uses it. Now, I need your attention again. The word mimnesco, which is the other part of the word hypo mimnesco, is used by the writer of Hebrews in two places that I need you to see. Hebrews 2, 6. What is man that you are mindful of him? That's the word mindful. Minesco. Mindful. It means to consider thoughtfully. To consider thoughtfully. Hebrews 2 6. Quoting from Psalm 2. Or Psalm 8, pardon me. Hebrews 2 6. What is man that you are mindful? Mimnesco. You care about him. You have your mind on his details. Then Hebrews 8, 12. Their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Mimnesco. I will not put into consideration. All right. Does it make sense? So, is it a memory issue or a, something about understanding and details? Understanding and details. So, in John 14, 26, go back there. He will bring to your remembrance whatever things I said to you. Now, if you were going to translate that into Believer's Convention Translation... Amen. 2018 version. What would you say, what would you replace the word remembrance with? Who can help me here? He will what? He will explain to you. All right? That's one. That's a version. Okay? Another person who can help me out? Yeah? Huh? I didn't say a whispering translation. Say it loud so I can hear. What is it? He will what? It will enlighten you. I like that. That's an amplified version. Any other person? Yeah? He will bring to your understanding. Yeah? Any other thing? It will further explain. Oh, you like the amplifier the law. Somebody else now. Yeah? He will exegete. Is that what you say? Come on, somebody. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you say? Huh? It would diamond you. Oh, come on. What do you call it? It will emphasize. Mm. That's some red, my man. Come on. Yeah, well. He what? It will bring to your attention. We are all correct. Hallelujah. That would be a serious translation. In other words, he's saying in the resurrection, we will find meanings to the teachings of Jesus in the four Gospels. So, the teachings of Jesus in the four Gospels we're about to see are for the church. It's just to understand the meaning. So, in other words, from the things Jesus said in Luke 24, 44, Pay attention. There was no difference in what he said in his resurrection and what he said before it. The difference is, if there were at all, is that there is a clarification or a further light on the things that he said. Let me see if you understand this. So, come on, let's see. Come on. So, in other words, from the things he said in his resurrection, everything he said in the four Gospels will be clear to us. Hallelujah. From the things he said in his resurrection, everything he says or he said before it will be clear to us. It also means, now, again, let me quickly mention this is vital. You know, we said that when Peter, for example, says, I'm sorry, when Matthew says, 
He instructed them. And then Luke says he expounded unto them or he opened their understanding. As important as what he said was, he doesn't give us the details. The details will be found in their sermons after. The proof and the fruit of this teaching will be found in their sermons and vitally in their epistles. Let me see if that's very clear to you. So you will notice that in their epistles will be an explanation of everything Jesus taught in the four Gospels. Look at John 16, 12. You know, we said that John 14, 26, does it apply to you and I? No, it applies directly to the men that were with him. In John 16, 12, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Albeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you. Now, verse 13 refers to what? The incarnation or the resurrection? So can we say, upon the resurrection, he will guide you into all of the truth? Can we say that? So, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. But upon my resurrection, all the things I said to you will have further light and further explanation. Would that be correct to say? Very good. So, these scriptures, therefore, these statements are applied to them. That was why in Acts 1, when they were going to choose someone to be part of them, because Jesus expressly said, you are my witnesses. What does he mean by you are my witnesses? In Luke 24, verse 48, Acts 1, 8. He's talking to the same people. Witnesses of what? Acts 1. When Judas fell away and he fell into destruction, Jesus calls him a child of Apollumi. A child of perdition. A word used for destruction. When he uses that phrase, then Peter goes into the Old Testament books, precisely David. And he says, look, this guy's habitation will be taken because it has been prophesied. Why is he talking like that? Jesus has already given them how to read the Old Testament. Now, he says, we need to choose someone to replace this guy. And look at 21. Let's take verse 21 together as a church. Let's go. Acts 1. Let's go. Wherefore, let's go. Wherefore, of these men, which have company with us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among them. Hold on there. That means there was a crowd of people, maybe 120, maybe 400, precisely. I'm not sure at this point. But, he says, of this group, the person that can replace Judas must not have missed one world changers conference. Amen. Bless you. You know, must one who went in and out. It's now clear to you in Luke 9, when Jesus said, Follow me. A guy says, I want to be with you. He said, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And another guy said, well, I want to follow you. But you know, I have to bury my dad. He says, let the dead bury the dead. Very harsh statement from the Lord. The other guy said, if I pack my things, I'm already in the bus. I'm following you. But I just want to tell my dad and mom. He says, he that puts his hand on the floor and looks back. He's not fit. What is he talking about? This work. Those who will witness his resurrection could not afford to lose sight of him for one minute. So, he's not talking salvation. He's not fit for the kingdom. He's not fit to preach this reality. Because this fellow must be in and out. He says, from the baptism, the next verse, 22, which John preached until the same day he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be what? A witness with us of his resurrection. 
Can I have an amen here now? So, this is a particular qualification. What it means is the explanation of the Old Testament was exclusively given to these men. Who's following this? Let me see your hand. These people must be his witnesses. They were there. They heard all his sermons and they got the clarification. They saw the fulfillment. And so therefore, all ministers afterwards will be disciples of these people. You must teach what they taught, how they taught it. You must emphasize what they emphasized alone. Watch this now. That's why, if you look at the very end in Acts 1, these folks, after Jesus was done for 40 days teaching, on Sunday after Believers' Convention in the afternoon, then they saw Jesus at the pastor's lobby. And they said, Lord Jesus, we had a great time. They came to Jesus. Well, we were so blessed, sir. In fact, <laughs> the exegesis is one of a kind, sir. Ah, I've never seen the Bible like that, you know. Sir, you are a gift to the body. You are. Ah, I've never, ever seen the Bible like that in my life. Ah, ah. Lord, now you be go. However, sir, um, this is just, we're not trying to say you don't know what you're saying. Since you are living today as it were, um, there's an area you didn't touch. Mm, I, I, not that you didn't touch it, maybe you want to touch it later, but I'm saying it's very late. Um, Lord, verse 6, he says, will you at this time don't forget, verse 3 says he was teaching about the kingdom. He said, would you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? In other words, where is the application? All these wonderful exegesis, explanation, insight, uh, uh, context, pretext, post-text, detest, in-text, Exam. Ah, ah. I've heard. But me, I'm a fisherman. He's a tax collector. Herod is still king. Poverty is still there. We are still under rule. When will you change our situation? They ask that question. How do we apply this to government? How? How? Then he says to them, it is not for you. I disagree with that verse, the way the verse was constructed. He simply said, it's not for you. But to know the times and this, or the season which the Father has put in his own power. He said, it's not for you. This is the one that belongs to the Father. In other words, it's not, the Father is not in the kingdoms of the world. This is his own kingdom. You shall receive power after which the Holy Ghost is come on you. This is the Father's kingdom. You will be witnesses of what I have done in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That is why, check all their sermons. They had no sermons for change of government change of commercial situation or things for industries and commerce and all that. Jesus just answered them. Let me see your hand if you're following this. Come on. So he simply responded that your job is to focus strictly on what I have done, what I have become, and my purpose and plan for man. That's what he just did to them. And they got it clear. Check all their sermons. All their sermons were saying the same thing. Are you in the house this morning? So the resurrection therefore brings clarity to many things that were said. When John said in John 1 29, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That was not a present tense event. John is talking about the resurrection. So many things were said by Jesus 
We're going to see it in a moment. In the four Gospels, that did not happen till he rose. In other words, Jesus said many things that were possible by faith, but not available till he rose from the dead. Can I have an amen here? And these are the things his resurrection explains. When John says, he that comes after me, his shoes are mightier than I, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That didn't happen in the four Gospels. All of John's prophecies were towards his resurrection. In Acts 1, 4, and 5, Jesus said, now is the time for the fulfillment of what John said. You shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, Acts 1, 4, and 5, not many days hence. John said it as though, as Jesus shows up like this, you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. It's possible, you believe, but it's not available. So, just like the words of the prophets of the Old Testament, the teachings of John, and those prophecies, and we're about to see the teachings of Jesus too, is like a check that is post-dated. You have the check. You can't cash it, but you will cash it when the money is available. The money will be yours. You can look forward to it if the person has integrity, because God has one. You can look forward to it, but you see, it only stays with you like a post-it check. You only cash it when the funds are there. And hear me, the funds will not be there till he rose from the dead. So there were many things that Jesus said to them that were post-dated checks. They were not realities of the day. They were realities of our day. Hallelujah. So go to Matthew 5. Are you ready? Are you ready now? Go to Matthew 5. In Matthew 5, he said, blessed are the poor, verse 3, in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn. I can tell you for free that when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Like Jesus talks, that's the subject matter. Those that don't have will have they will have, and it will be well spoken of them. And so he talks about this poor in spirit. This poor in spirit are those who will mourn, that those who have become meek because of what will happen. They hunger and thirsty, and thirst and they will be filled. They are those that will now become merciful, that those that are now pure in heart, they are now peacemakers. What is Jesus talking about? Jesus is like someone campaigning for an election. He's saying what he's going to do. On the Sermon on the Mount, he's announcing his kingdom. These things are possible, but we're not yet available. He is telling them what you can call today the characteristics, the qualities, the, as it were, the traits of the new creation man who will be found in the kingdom. That's what the sermon is about. He's not asking them for a change of ways or a change of behavior. He's not doling out rewards. He's only stating the facts and realities of his kingdom. Let me see your hand if you're following this. All this becomes clear when he rose from the dead. And so he talks to them about the things written in the law. He said, you have heard it in Matthew 5, in verse for example, look at Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men. They will see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven. That doesn't make sense. Which father? Whose father? Jesus is making promises. He's writing them a post-data check. They will see your good works. Which good works? These are the good works of the new creation man in his kingdom upon his resurrection. And so in chapter 5, he says to them in 43, you have heard it has been said, you love your neighbor and hate your enemies, quoting Moses. Now I say unto you, in this kingdom, you will love your enemies. You will bless them that curse you. You will do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. This is why you will not see his disciples reflect this at all. All this only happened 
in the resurrection. Let me see how you're following this. He's stating the realities of his kingdom. That's what he's doing here. That you be the children of your father, which is in heaven, which makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and the unjust. If you love them, we love you. What reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And verse 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. This is not happening yet. Praise the Lord. This is a future fact. Jesus is announcing the body of Christ in his sermons. He's talking about the new creation, the people that are born of God. No one was born of God till the resurrection. But he states it. That's why when he sends them out, he says, tell them the kingdom is here. What does he mean by the kingdom is here? I am here. And so he only states possibilities, but they are not yet available. Hallelujah. And so he gets to chapter 6. Then he says to them, watch this now. In verse 7, when you pray, use not vain repetition of the heathen do, for they think that they have been heard by so much speaking. Be ye therefore not like unto them, for your father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. Now, hear this well. He says, your father knows what you need. That's interesting. I used to think he meant, if I need a car now, a 20 19 Mercedes Benz model of a car, your father knows that's what you need. That would be very interesting. Because why then do I pray? And then say, I am praying my need. This is the danger of lifting the scripture out of context. Jesus is simply saying, God knows what you need. And what you need may not be what you think you need. And he says it. He says, verse 9, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, popularly called the Lord's Prayer. I prayed that prayer before I knew who Jesus was. Our Father, who art in heaven, hello, hello be your name, you know, just... Rehearsing it like people in a Quranic school. He says, pray therefore, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth. Pay attention to these pronouns. Now, I'm so glad that recently, um, very intelligent Bible scholars, interestingly, including the Pope of the Catholic Church, <laughs> agreed that there ought to be a pronoun before verse 11. And I think that's consistent. When he says, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. What do you mean by your will be done as in heaven? I told you, it means you will do it in man. Is that very clear? All right now. So it ought to be, verse 11, you give us this day our daily bread. You give us. Now, some people say, well, see in that prayer, God even talks about praying for material things. That's why he said, your father knows what you need. Bread. I am not a fan of bread. So in the Father's kingdom, he wants to give me bread. So he gives me this day. Which day? This day. What day? Any day you pray it. So every time I want to pray, I will say, Bread. Bread? No butter? No, just bread. Is it slice? The father determines the bread. (laughs) (laughs) 
What if I'm fasting? He will still give you the bread. And someone said, no, 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 don't do that. The bread there is figurative. Oh, figurative of what? Car? <laughs> Land? Houses? Oh, no, don't do that. When he says, give us this day, the day he's referring to is the day of the kingdom. That is, in this kingdom, you give us the daily bread. Now, the word daily bread there, I guess, um, uh, in fact, we have a, 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 a man, a devotional like that, that's our daily bread. Uh, lovely. But when he says, you give us this day in this kingdom, don't forget, Jesus is announcing what? His kingdom. He says, in this kingdom, there is a daily bread. What do you mean by daily bread? Now, the word daily is the word eposios in the Greek. E-P-I-O-U-S-I-O-S. You'll find it used in, the Hebrew, in Luke 11, 3. It means sufficient bread. And I found a very operative word with it uh, from the word epipar. I'll, I'll spell it for you. E-P-I-P-E-R. E-P-I-P-E-R. It means a bread that comes after or something that comes after. In other words, Jesus was saying, and this is the reason why the translator had a problem with it, and I think I examined that with someone that I know translates also, that the thing was that in literal Greek, it means give us the bread for tomorrow. So, the English word closest would be daily bread, tomorrow's bread. But really, it carries the connotation of what will last till tomorrow, or what will last from tomorrow. Sufficient bread, he refers to. And so, the bread he refers to here can't be loaf of bread. In fact, it's thought and agreed that it's like Jesus was quoting Proverbs chapter 30. Quickly go there. Are you still in church? Proverbs 30 and then verse 18. Or verse 8, sorry. Proverbs 30 verse 8. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Very likely. But then if you go again to his word, remember what he told them. He said, the spirit of truth will bring to your remembrance everything I said. And upon his resurrection, when he rose, he said, these are the things I was telling you. And I tell you, it includes this prayer. So, in John 4, 34, they went to get food for him. They came, Master, are you not hungry again? He said, my food is to do the will of he that sent me and to finish his work. My food. So, Jesus, therefore, uses food figuratively to what he gives in the resurrection. And that's what's in the prayer. People have thought, that prayer is Old Testament prayer. That prayer is Old Testament prayer. No, it's not Old Testament prayer. It's actually a New Testament confession. Because Jesus is talking about his kingdom. In my kingdom, there is sufficient bread. Sufficient food. Are you following me here? Look at John 6. Something happened in John 6. He multiplied five loaves and two fish. And as those guys, as they were eating and consuming it and getting excited, he said to them, in John 6, from verse 26, he said, look, you came to eat loaves of bread, but in verse 27, John 6, labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give unto you, for him, God the Father has sealed. In other words, he calls everlasting life food. And as they were about to kind of talk about bread, he says to them, Moses, verse 32, gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father gave you what? John 6, 32, gave you what? The true bread. 
Can we take verse 33 together? Let's go. John 6. For the bread of God. Let's take it again. For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives. Verse 35. Let's go. I am the bread of life. Let's go. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. Praise the Lord. Look at verse 48. Let's go together. I am that bread of life. Are you there? Let's take verse 50 together. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, and a man may eat thereof and not die. Verse 51, let's go. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread which I give is my flesh, for I give for the life of the world. Hallelujah. That's the bread he was talking about. And the bread is only available in his resurrection. Look at the next verse, 53. Let's go, 53. Verily, verily, I say unto you, let's go, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Verse 54. Whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Zopohio in the Greek. Resurrection. Then, follow this. He says, in verse 56, let's say 56 together. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, I in him. 57, as the living father sent me, and I live by the father, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. Let's take 58 together, everybody, let's shout it out. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eats of this bread shall live forever. That's the bread he's talking about. Was it possible in the four Gospels? Uh uh. Was it possible by faith? Was it available? No. In other words, the bread is the bread of his resurrection. Follow this. So, this is the bread of his resurrection. So when he rose from the dead, every teaching of his became clearer to his apostles. That's the bread he was talking about. This is the bread. Again, in John, watch this, John 3, he talks about water in John 3. He says, except the man, Nicodemus comes to him, he says, except the man is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. John 3, 3. Jenaho and nothing. He can't see. Then Nicodemus asks the question, does it mean I have to go into my mother's womb, but born a second time? He said, no. Very, very, I say unto you, except a man is born of water. Now, he just used bread. Now he has used water. He cannot enter. What do you mean water? Water which refers to the spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's what he says to him. The wind blows where it leaves. You hear the sound. You can't tell us where it's coming from, where it's going to. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And so Nicodemus is wondering, what are now the Spirit? Then he says to him in John 3. He said in John 12, John 3, 12, I'm sorry. He said, look, I'm saying you earthly things. You don't get it. I'm using earthly things to describe heavenly realities. How you use heavenly truths? They said, you know something, Nico? He said, what's up? Remember Moses? Yes, I do. As he lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be raised from the dead. And whoever looks at him will not perish again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. Was it possible in the four Gospels? Yes, my faith. Was it available? No, it was only available in his resurrection. So the water of Jesus is the water of his resurrection. Are you following this? In John 4, he meets the woman at the well. She's at the well. She's trying to get water. And Jesus says, you know, give me water. Say, you are a Jew. And now, what do you, you asked me to fetch water for you. And all that. Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God, and he that asked of you, 
You'll have asked of him, he'll have given you living water. She's looking at him, living water? And then in verse 13 and 14, he says, if you drink of this water, you will thirst again. But he that drinks of the water shall give shall be in him a well, springing up unto everlasting life. Jesus' is water is life. His own life. His bread is his life. In the resurrection. His water is his life. In the resurrection. In John 7. So can you now see how Jesus was teaching? He was only making what? Promises. He was giving post-data checks. That will be cashable upon the fulfillment of all the promises. Praise the Lord. And so in John 7. He goes to the top and the feast of the tabernacles. He said if anybody is thirsty. Let him come and drink. If you have brought your mouth like this, oh, you'll have got penalty, won't throw it. Because you just didn't understand what he was saying. As the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. As a younger minister, we say, touch your stomach out of your belly. No. The scriptures talk about Christ. It has to be Christ's belly. And the word coleo is used for the innermost being, one. It's also used for the womb. Out of his womb shall flow rivers of living water. What womb? The next verse. Because really, there was no Old Testament text that says exactly what he's saying. So just like we have said, that is a summary of what? All the prophecies of the Old Testament world. Let me see your hand if you understand that. Out of his resurrection will flow rivers of living water. Because the next verse says, This speak he of the Spirit, with those who believe on him should receive. But the Holy Ghost was not yet given. For Jesus was not yet glorified. In other words, his water is the spirit in his resurrection. Amen. Come on now. Come on. So this is a resurrection reality. Remember Peter, times of refreshing. From his resurrection, we are revived. Hallelujah. So that's his water. In John 2, he goes into the temple and he says, destroy this temple. After three days, I, it is a, it is a, I will destroy this temple. That's not what he said. He said, destroy this temple because that's what they're going to do. After three days, I will raise it up. And everybody gets, what is that nonsense? Who do you think you are? How do you think you are? What do you, how can you, do you know how long it took us to build this place? Oh, fool, slow of heart. Even his disciples were confused. Master, even if you multiply five loaves and two fish, it can't be this temple. But when he rose from the dead and the spirit of truth brought this, this oh, he was talking about the body of Christ. They didn't know that until the resurrection. We said the resurrection is not a mere event. It is the revelation. The revelation or it is the explanation. Again, in John 13, he removes his clothes, wears a towel, goes down and begins to wash the feet of the disciples. And Peter, just like his manner was, ah! Master, you can't wash my feet. I'm only a brother in charge. You are the archbishop. For humility. And Jesus said, if I wash you not. Again, he will use the physical to point to the spiritual. If I wash you not, you have no part in me. He's talking about his spirit in the resurrection. You have no part in me. And then Peter said, wash every part, wash inside my ear, everything, I'm ready, you know. He didn't get it. Say, you are all clean, every one of you. You are all clean. 
So he's talking about his resurrection. The same thing. I need your attention here now. Go back to that John 6 slowly. So can we see that both the bread and the water and his house, are we together? That is the walk of the spirit in the resurrection. So the bread, the water, now go back to John 6. In John 6, as he said, I am that bread that came from heaven. Is he describing his incarnation or his resurrection? Come on, guys. So when he says, your will be done on earth, that is in heaven. Is that the incarnation or the resurrection? That's the resurrection. In the resurrection, God's will has been done in the earth. Hallelujah. Watch this now. So when he said, I'm the living bread that came from heaven, was that possible in the four gospels? Yes, possible by faith, but not yet available. So has he said that? He said, if you drink my blood, hey! Disciples said, God. Hey! Chai. Drink his blood, eat my flesh. All of them are resurrection realities. Then they became offended. He said, does this offend you, 61? Verse 62, John 6. What? And if you see the Son of Man ascend there where he was before, then he throws the explanation. It is the Spirit <laughs> that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. That means the blood of Jesus on the cross does not wash sins. I knew you were going to be quiet. <laughs> if you thought his blood that wasted away is what washed sins, then we should say, oh fools, slow of heart to believe. Then you'll have believed water to wash sins and bread too. You see, it is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. Everything I am saying to you is about the spirit and life. So the blood of Jesus Christ in the resurrection is the spirit of God. Hallelujah. That's the walk of the spirit. Amen. That's the work of the Spirit. So, is his bread the Spirit? Huh? Is his water the Spirit? Let's take it again. Is his bread the Spirit? Is his water the Spirit? Is his blood the Spirit? That was quiet. Is his blood the Spirit? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> glory, 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 glory. <laughs> Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Look at Matthew's gospel 26. Are you still there? Glory to God. Matthew's gospel 26. This is the Passover table. And then he says to them in 26, Take, eat. This is my body. Oh my God. If you thought he was talking about the bread, come, let me hug you. This is my body. Luke says, broken for you. Possible? Available? No. He's referring to his resurrection. Broken, shared for you. Then he says, now don't lose this one. 28. Then he took the cup and said, drink all of it. Drink all of it. This is not the Passover wine. They've been taking it since they were young. Again, all these things become clear on the road to Emmaus. Hallelujah. <laughs> and also when he met them in Luke 24, 44. Then he says, this is my blood of the New Testament. I'm sure you knew that wasn't the wine. Come on. This is my blood of the New Testament. Need your attention now. This is cool. 
which is shared for many for the remission of sins. The idea we have is that he took the blood or uh, on the cross he shed the blood for who? God says, how many liters? Pints. It's fine. The, it's, the demands of justice have been met. Hallelujah. Thank you, son. I'm, I can now die in peace. No, 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 no. What does it mean? The, the, the sins were somewhere. And so, he took his blood to that room. Remember that room I started with? A secret room somewhere in the heavenly places where sins yesterday, today, and forever are stored. So he takes his blood. <laughs> you need to realize that both his bread and his blood were taken inside. If we drink of it, that means the effect is in us. That's not physical blood, that is spirit. Hallelujah. <laughs> we drank all of it. I said, we drank all of it. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah. We drank all of it. That's what he's saying. Now, what does he mean by remission? Now, the term remission of sins, and Luke uses it too in Luke 22. The, the term remission of sins is one of those words that you need to be careful. Now, I believe in the coming days, I, I will <laughs> explore the meaning better, you know, uh, uh, more authoritatively now. The word remission of sins is, is a bit of one of these words in the Bible, in the New Testament Greek, that has many connotations. Is the word aphesis, A P H E S I S. Now, the word aphesis has a verb. It's called aphemi, A P H E I M E I. Aphemi means to let go, to release from, to remove. Okay, now. This is the reason why that term usually is used for different things. For example, in Luke 4.18, it says to preach deliverance to the captives. Why does he use the same word aphesis? Because it means to set free. Okay. Now, if I say it is for the setting free of sins. Who's following what I'm saying here? That means the blood removes the sins. The blood is not removing you. It's removing the sins. In other words, just like Jesus' water and his bread, particularly the water, what he's referring to here is the removing work, the cleansing work of the blood of his sacrifice. And that cleansing work is by the Spirit. So oftentimes, he's not referring to pardon. Aphesis is not pardon. No, aphesis is a release, a letting go. So the Father is not pardoning. The Father is cleansing, is remaking. Hallelujah. <laughs> this is the new creation. Pay attention. That's why many times, watch this, Jesus used healing to typify or to describe his salvation. A wholeness. A completeness. So the work of God's forgiveness is in us. It's a cleansing, a healing, a taking away. Call it a new creation. Watch this. And so, 
Listen carefully. Stronger than pardon. When in John Luke 5, there's this guy who is sick of the palsy. They bring him through the, the roof and Jesus says, your faith has made you whole. And in 20, Luke 5, 20, he says, your sins are forgiven. Aphesis, Aphiemi. Why is he saying that? Was it possible? Yes. Was it available? No. That will only happen as a work of his spirit. That's what he's talking about. In John Luke 7 again, he meets the woman who goes at his feet. And she's supposed to be a prostitute to sinner. And then he says the same words to her in verse 46 or 47, I believe. He says, your sins are forgiven. When he says that, he is telling you what is available in his resurrection. He's giving everyone a post-data check. When you believe it, John 1.12 says, he now gives you the right. That's in the four Gospels. To be called the sons of God in the resurrection. So every time he says your sins are forgiven you, he's campaigning his kingdom. He's making to your attention, bringing to your attention what he's about to do. But in the four gospels, you can believe it and hold on to it. And in his resurrection, you go straight to the bank, praise God, and you cast that and you become the born again man. Hallelujah. Who's following what I'm saying this morning? So Jesus was making promises. That's why upon his resurrection, he says, repentance, Luke 24, 47, which is the taking away of sins from the heart of the man who is not saved, will be preached in his authority, in his work, in his accomplished task among all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So when you hear your sins are forgiven, he's campaigning. He's telling you what he will do. In John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have in himself the light of life. That is futuristic. In John 10, 10, I am come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Now, is that, was that possible in the four Gospels? Yes, my faith. Was it available? No. It's only available in the resurrection. Let me see your hand this morning if you're getting it. So Jesus was making promises. But upon his resurrection, the Allos Paracletos now brought the attention of all the twelve back to the things he taught. That's why what they taught in their epistles is what Jesus taught in the four gospels. All they did was explain them. Hallelujah. You following this? So his blood, his blood in the new creation, his blood in the resurrection is his spirit. Praise God. But I thought it was the blood of God, the blood of Jesus that watched this. Yes, watch this. Look at Ezekiel 36. Look at the things the prophet said. Ezekiel 36. So the blood is used figuratively or as an example to point to the life of Christ. His spirit in the resurrection. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. I'll start from 25. Can we read it together? Are you in church? Let's go, come on, let's go. Then will I sprinkle clean water. Everybody, let's go. Let's go. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Water there now. Look at 26. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you an heart of flesh. 27, let's go. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgment and what? So is the cleansing... An external work or an internal work? And whose work is it? The work of the Spirit. So when Jeremiah says, 
This is a new covenant I'll make with the house of Israel in those days. I will write my laws where? In their inward part. How is he doing that? By his spirit. It's based on that that Jeremiah now says their sins and iniquities will not come into consideration. Why? Because I'm working in them. It's not a blood that pacifies God. It's the work of his spirit in man. Hallelujah. <laughs> Who's following this this morning? Praise the Lord. It's the work of his spirit. So the blood of Jesus Christ in the resurrection is a shorthand of saying the work of the spirit in man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you there? Let's go further. Let's go further. Notice in Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. He says, I'll put my spirit where? In. In. Jeremiah 31, the same thing. I'll put it in their hearts. That's the work of the spirit. That is not blood flowing in your heart. Blood, if you take physical blood, it cannot get to your spirits. But it is the spirit that quickeneth. Hallelujah. It's the spirit that quickened it because where was sin located? Sin was located in man. And redemption, remission of sins is to take it away and give a brand new heart, a new creation, a new man, which is a function of the bread of Christ that we ate, the water of Christ, the spirit of Christ, which is the blood of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Does that make sense? Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, we're quite a bit. Praise God. <laughs> he makes sense. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, in the resurrection, the blood of Jesus is the Spirit of God in our hearts today. That's His blood. His blood is the work of the Spirit. Back to Matthew 6. You learning something here? So you give us this day our daily bread. So the bread of Christ is his spirit in the resurrection. And that spirit is in us forever. Eposios and Tion. That is what will be our food forever. The indwelling of the Spirit. So the indwelling of the Spirit is the proof of the aphesis of God. God's remission of sins is not a pardon of wrongdoings alone. It is the indwelling of the Spirit in man. Let me see if you understand that. Come on, watch this now. So, so, so. He made those promises. So in John 6, you give us this day our, who can give me a translation? Believers Convention translation. You give us this day, what day now? The day of the kingdom. Can we say in the resurrection? You give us, so that prayer is not a prayer of the Old Testament. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's the confession of the kingdom. So we say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed. That means you are in the realm of the Spirit. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom is here. Your will is now done amongst us and it is in heaven. You have given us this day our sufficient food. What do you mean? He says, you forgive us our trespasses <laughs> so that I've explained that to you before because we don't do so that he does so that because we are now new creations in Christ we now forgive those who trespass against us you lead us not into temptation but you deliver us from the evil one these are affirmations of the new creation in Christ I wake up in the morning and I say his kingdom has come. His will is done. 
I have the sufficient food. My sins are forgiven. So therefore now I forgive others. He delivers me from the evil one. His is the kingdom. His is the power. And his is the glory. Forever. This is not in the four gospels. Forever can only happen in the resurrection. This is the work of the Spirit in us. Remember, Jesus said, when you eat of this bread, you will never hunger again. When you drink of this water, you will never thirst again. When you drink this blood, what you have will not be blood. What you have is life. So the blood of Jesus in the resurrection is eternal life. Blood cannot take away sins. Blood can, he just, what does he have? What takes away sins is God himself. And God himself is a spirit that walks in us. Hallelujah. Woo. Sit down one minute, I'm about to close on that. So Jesus was making a promise. This is now our confession. You gave us this daily bread. You gave us this sufficient food. This food is sufficient to eternity. When people argue, uh, are your sins washed yesterday, today, and forever? They begin to argue about that. That is primary school talk. Hallelujah. You, we're just, when we say that, we're just bringing you to come and understand. Small, 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 small. What we are saying is this. The Spirit of God has taken away sins from our heart. What we are saying is this. We are new creation in Christ Jesus. What we are saying is this. I have a new heart. What we are saying is this. I have a new spirit. What I'm saying is this. Glory to God. Sit down, sit down, sit down. So we still gave you kindergarten talk. Yesterday, today, and forever. No, it's not. Hey, yes. Hallelujah. A new heart I will give them. A new spirit I'll put within them. That is yesterday, today, and forever. We're not dealing with pardon. We're talking about the kingdom. The new creation man. He says, except a man is born again, he can't enter it. Now we are born again. We are in it already. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So what did Jesus say? Everything I've said, I pray the Father, he will give you another comforter. That he may abide with you forever. This is the spirit of the reality. In other words, the spirit in us is to bring into reality all that Jesus ever did. And so the spirit in us is that aphesis. No wonder. Begin to close from here. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 and in verse 14. After he had spoken about the resurrection... Then he says, Paul, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14. He says, if Christ is not raised from the dead. Remember that? If Christ is not raised from the dead. Paul says, our preaching is vain. Then he says, your faith is vain. Kenos in the Greek. Which means it's of no effect. He says our message makes no sense. If Christ didn't rise. What are we preaching about? Then he says your faith. I believe I'm sanctified. I believe I'm a house of God. I believe I am the temple of the Holy Ghost. He said, if Christ is not raised, all those things mean nothing. In 1 Corinthians 6, 11, he says, such were some of you, but you are washed. How? In the name of the Lord, he says, you're sanctified. You see, it is by the Spirit. So the blood is the Spirit. 
you are washed. Paul says, Paul says, if Christ is not raised, and he uses the word egero in the Greek, E-G-E-I-R-O, a present tense continuous. That is, is not raised past tense. No, it means Christ is alive. A living fact. Now, that term egero is not used for somebody who has left your sight. It means a living being now. If he's not a living being in us, then our preaching doesn't make sense. In verse 17, he says then, is our faith, verse 17, he says, our faith is vain, matthias, which means useless. And you are yet where? In your sins. Christ being raised from the dead is why you are called a new creation. In Christ. It's not a pardon. A pardon is there, yes. It's a new creation. The man born again. The man born of the Spirit. So when we say, sins yesterday, today, and forever, all we're saying is you're a new creation in Christ. His Spirit is now in you. Hallelujah. His spirit is now in you. Hallelujah. How, what's the proof of affairs of God? The indwelling of the spirit. I am a new creation. I am born of the spirit of God. Hallelujah. Now, I have new habits. I have new desires. He's walking in me. He's walking through me. Because in the new creation, God makes manifest himself through man. This is the dream of God. So don't think of re redemption or better still remission of sins. Like a payment thing. We are paying back. We are collecting back. No! It's a new creation. It's the walk of the spirit. So the blood of Jesus Christ is the spirit at work in us today. We drank of his blood. We drank of his spirit. All of it. All of it. All of it. All of it. We ate of his bread. We are alive forever. We are alive forever. His life is in us today. His, his life is in us today. We are taking of that bread. It's sufficient for us. Yesterday, today, and forever. Stand to your feet and bless the Lord. Your spirit in me. Your power at work through me. I'm a man in Christ. Supernatural man. Sing that song. Your spirit in me. Your power at work I'm a man in Christ, supernatural. Take it again, your spirit in me. Your spirit in me. Your power I walk through me. I'm a man in Christ, supernatural man. Sing that song. Your spirit in me. Your power I walk through No fear here. Power walk through me. I'm a man in Christ, 
Take it again. Your spirit in me. Your spirit in me. Your power I want to be. I'm a man in Christ. Supernatural man. Your spirit in me. Your spirit in me. Your power I want to be. I'm a man in Christ. Supernatural. No fear here. Raise your voice. No doubt here. Only rivers of joy. Of joy. Act on that. Come on. No doubt here. I have the spirit. No fear here, no doubt here. No doubt here. Holy rivers of joy. No fear here. No doubt here. Your spirit in me, one more time. Your spirit in me. Your power I want to be. I'm a man in Christ, supernatural man. Your spirit in me. Your power at work in me. I'm a man in Christ, supernatural. Raise your voice, no fear here, no doubt here. No doubt here. No I am a river of joy. No fear here. No doubt here. I am the spirit. There is a redeemer, Jesus Christ, on side. Precious Lamb of God, Messiah, the whole world. Thank you, O oh my Father. Do you understand it now? Thank you, oh my father. So you understand why we say your work on earth is done. Great and your work on earth is done. Thank you, oh my father. For giving us your son. For giving us your son. Giving us your spirit, I am a bagger. Your spirit, your spirit in me, your power. 